What a great opportunity today to, to sing together, to worship together in song. And I want us to worship together in the Word as we continue looking at God's goodness and His faithfulness and what He's given to us in a series of messages I've called Summer on the Mount. We're going to look together today at the beginning of that Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. If you don't have your own copy of the Scripture on your way out today at the welcome desk, we would be happy to, to send you home with your own copy of the Scripture. We believe the Spirit of God uses the Word of God to make us more like the Son of God. So we want you to have your own copy so that every day you're in the Word, every day you're hearing from the Lord and, and learning to hear His voice and how to walk with Him and, and to be able to, to know the, the very things we talked about and sung about today, His goodness and His mercy and how it follows after us. So if you've got your copy of the Scripture, if you've got that, that complimentary copy, Matthew chapter 5 is on page 551. 551, we're going to look at the first 16 verses today and a, and a message that I've entitled, Your Best Life Now. Some of you on the way in and we're able to do this. Some of you on the way out will be able to have a, an opportunity to visit with Rick and Karen. And there are many who, who are looking at Rick and Karen today with, with gratitude, with, with such joy because of the investment they have had in the life of our church and in the kingdom. But I know there are some of you who are a little bit jealous because you are ready to be retired. Some of you haven't even started working yet, and you're ready to be retired. You just think that the best life is the retired life. Brother Steve was sitting right here in the first service, and when I said the, the best life is the retired life, I got a hearty amen from Brother Steve. He, he agrees that when you're retired, every day is Saturday except Sunday. And, and there, there is a joy that comes in retirement that you've never had any other time in life. But what Jesus is going to help us see today is that our best life doesn't come when we've reached a certain status or when we have a certain amount of money. Our best life doesn't come when we've, we've gotten that promotion or we've married that right person. That our best life happens when we are walking in fullness with Jesus. That, that our best life can be right now, no matter your income level, no matter your education level, no matter your skin color or your heritage or anything else, your best life happens when you are walking in fullness with Jesus. Your best life can be right now. So what we, we saw last week as we began this sermon series, even before we get to the Sermon on the Mount, we, we looked at what Jesus had been doing with his disciples. He had called them to follow him. He had shown them what this life in the kingdom looked like, fishing for people as he ministered, as he taught, as he reached. And everywhere that he went, he called people to repent. It's not a word that we like to hear because repentance is this idea that you're going one direction, but you need to change your mind so that you can begin walking a new direction. And yet Jesus declared repentance as the greatest news anyone could ever hear because that repentance was walking away from self and walking away from sin and embracing the Savior and the Master. And so Jesus last week began to show the disciples and show us that, that this is his command, that is to repent. This is his call, it is to walk with him. And this is his commission, is to minister and teach and reach wherever we go so that we are turning people's attention and affection and allegiance to Jesus. But as Jesus set the example and as he showed the disciples what this new life, this new kingdom was about, the crowds began to grow. Because when you're teaching with such authority, when you're changing people's lives, when, when you suddenly are welcoming people in who've been told by everyone else, you don't belong here. And yet now Jesus was drawing all of these people in. He took the disciples aside because he wanted them to see it, it wasn't about drawing crowds. It wasn't about numbers. It truly was about transformed lives and redeemed hearts. So let's look together in Matthew chapter five. We'll look at the first 16 verses today. Over the next several weeks in this series, Summer on the Mount, we'll unpack all of what Jesus teaches in this sermon. But today, these 16 verses, we'll look at your best life now. Look at Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 1. When he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. 
Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You are blessed when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven. For that's how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Verse 13, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt should lose its taste, how can it be made salty? It's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You're the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and it gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Your best life now. If you were to take a few minutes and and to make a list, and if I were to say, write down this question, what makes me happy? And you were to jot down maybe the top two or three things that come to mind. What makes me happy? What would you put on that list? What makes me happy? For some people, they they might say that it's a certain group of people make them happy or a a, a certain video game, or it it could be that that a a certain situation in life brings them happiness. But all of us could answer that question with probably not a great deal of thought. What makes me happy? What if you were then to make another list and and. uh, on the title of that list, you were to, to write, what makes me holy? What is it that makes me holy? What are those things that, that allow me to walk away from the things of the world and, and to walk more closely with Jesus? What are those things that, that demonstrate in my life that I've been chosen and set aside by Jesus? What makes me holy? It may be that, that daily time where you're spending time reading the, the word and in prayer and could be certain times of worship like we've had this morning where you really feel like set you apart and make you more useful to Jesus, closer to Jesus. What makes me holy? And then the interesting exercise would be to compare those two lists. What makes me happy and what makes me holy? And are they different? And if they're different, why are they different? And Could it be that in walking with Jesus, suddenly my holiness becomes my happiness? That suddenly I I realize I've been made for these things. And so now as I'm being set aside for Jesus, the very things that make me different from the world and that draw me away from the things of the world are the things that suddenly make my soul come alive. (laughs) For most people, those lists would be different. But Jesus is telling the disciples, I'm going to give you a kingdom and a new life where happiness and holiness go hand in hand. Because he's not called people to be happy. He's called them to be holy. But what they discover is in walking in holiness, you find a joy you've never known before. Your best life can be now. And Jesus is showing us how. Three things that we see in these 16 verses. The first in verses one and two is this. Jesus saw individuals more than he saw crowds. Jesus saw individuals more than he saw crowds. We, we see in the beginning of chapter five, it says, when he saw the crowds, they saw them and he knew that they mattered. In Matthew chapter nine, we're gonna see where Jesus once again sees the crowds and it bothers him because they are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus sees the crowds, but he wants the disciples to understand it is about individual change and individual transformation. And so the disciples knew that Jesus was the Messiah. And in their mind, the Messiah was the one who was going to come and drive out the Romans and set a king back on the throne in Israel. And so the, the crowds that were coming around them were, had to have been exciting for the disciples because they realized we're, we're on the front end of this, that, that the, the rabbi has called us to follow him. And and now the crowds are coming and we're going to be a part of this new kingdom and the Romans are going to be cast out and we're going to get to be a part of it. And so there had to be this great excitement that they are on the front end of something phenomenal. And so Jesus wanted them to make sure that they understood what this kingdom was about. And so he removed them from the crowds and it says that he went up on a mountainside and he sat down. And then his disciples came to them. And sitting down, Jesus took that, that 
posture of a rabbi. The rabbi would sit in the synagogue and he would teach. And so here they are outside and Jesus is seated. And they called him rabbi. They knew he was a teacher. But he removed them from the crowds. The, the very things that, that they surely in their mind thought, we, we don't want to leave the crowd, do we? And Jesus said, yes, we do. Now, by the time you get to the end of Matthew chapter 7, there, there's a crowd that's there. It's clear from the beginning that Jesus has called the disciples because he wants them as individuals, as this group of 12, or, or maybe it's the 70 at this point, but he's removed them because he wants them to understand. It's not about the crowds, it's about the individuals. It's those individual stories that, that we've seen Jesus make a difference. When Jesus looked to Zacchaeus and told him to come down from the tree so they go to his house. When they, when they passed blind Bartimaeus on, on the road there by Jericho and, and he, he gave him his sight. When the woman at the well came and, and no one else was there except Jesus and, and he told her things that no one else knew and he led her to faith. When, when the woman with the issue of blood touched Jesus, it's those individual moments. And so what Jesus is wanting them and he wants us to see is, is when we are faithful to follow him, we're faithful to go fishing for people as Jesus has called us to do. The crowds are going to arrive because when you minister to needs and, and when you give the truth, people are longing for it and you help people know you belong here. The world has told you you don't belong with them, but you belong with us. The crowds are going to come. But Jesus wants us to see it's about individual change, not about collective numbers. And so Jesus went up on the mountainside and he sat down. It's almost like a, a teacher is saying, I, I'd rather have a, a much smaller teacher to student ratio. A teacher that, that's got a, a four to one it, it is going to have much more impact in the classroom than a teacher that's 20 to one. There's 20 students. It's much harder to deal with than just those four. And so Jesus has removed them because he wants the disciples not to be distracted by the crowds, not to measure their effectiveness by the numbers, but he wants them to, to understand truly what's the foundation of this kingdom. Two years ago, our daughter Hallie started her career as a high school English teacher. One of my best friends, Darren, is a Edward Jones representative there in Winsboro, but Darren had been a teacher and a coach for years and years. And so he began to coach Hallie. Anytime we get together, riding together to a ball game or at church or whatever it might be, Darren would ask, her, how's it going? And he would always give her advice. And he told her, and if you've ever been in a classroom, you know this, you have to set the standards high from the very beginning. You can't go in and, and, and hope that as a teacher, you're, you're just going to get to know them and they're going to find you to be really nice and, and, and you're going to be so, so easygoing. He said, you got you to be really strict from the beginning. If you need to, over time, you can soften and, and begin to, to build some of those relationships and, and offer some grace and mercy over time. But initially, if you don't get run over, especially as a first time teacher, he said, you got to be strict. So it's almost like Jesus is, is showing them, here's what happens when the kingdom begins to break in. But I want you to understand, what are the standards of the kingdom? And so he calls them out from the crowd, sits them down on the mountainside, and begins to teach them. And so in verses 3 through 12, we, we see the second truth in the passage, is that Jesus blesses Christ-like character. Jesus blesses Christ-like character. In, in verses 3 through 12, you see that word blessed over and over and over. It, it's an unusual word. It, it's almost impossible to translate from Greek into English. Some, some of your translations say blessed. Some, some of your translations may say happy. Happy are these. Happy are those. And yet happy, sometimes you realize, is built off that word happening. And, and if things are good, then we're happy. And if things are, are bad, then, then we're, we're sad and and. And Jesus doesn't want us to build our emotions on circumstances. And so one of the commentaries I read this week said, maybe the, the better idea is that Jesus is telling them, if you've arrived at this status, then you deserve congratulations. This time of year, you, you're giving congratulations to a lot of people. Today, we have the opportunity to, to say thank you to Rick and Karen and give them congratulations. Many of you have graduated high school or college in the last few weeks, and, and you've gotten congratulations and notes of affirmation and, and gifts of some kind. Weddings often happen during this time of year, and we congratulate those who've reset certain status because we're so excited that they've arrived. And Jesus is saying, congratulations are due to those who understand the character of the kingdom. Look how he describes it, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is there. 
He says, you deserve congratulations if you realize I'm not looking for self-confident people. Jesus says, congratulations are due to you if you realize I'm looking to, for those who are dependent on me. So those that are poor in spirit. He says, I'm not looking for people who arrive and who say, Jesus, I'm here. The party can start. Jesus, you're lucky to have me on the team. And, and so show me what you want me to do and I'll get it taken care of. He says, no, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Congratulations are due to those because you're coming into the kingdom recognizing I am the king. That you're recognizing what we saw in Colossians, that all of us deserve an eternity separated from Jesus because of our sin. And yet Jesus, in his grace and mercy, has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into his kingdom. He said, what I need is people who aren't excited about themselves, but who are completely dependent on me. See, congratulations are due to those people because I'm not looking for the self-confident or the haughty or the arrogant. I'm looking for the people who are poor in spirit, but know that they find everything in me. And he says, yours is the kingdom of heaven. He said, you really want to enjoy the kingdom? You want to experience the kingdom? Then it comes by completely emptying yourself and letting me fill you up. Secondly, he says, blessed are those who mourn. Congratulations are due to those who are mourning. But Jesus, this doesn't sound like a really good public relations campaign. That you're saying congratulations are due to those who are completely empty of themselves and congratulations are due to those who are mourning. You know how miserable it is to mourn, to cry, to be sad? What is Jesus saying? He says, I'm looking for those who want to be a part of this kingdom and, and, and they recognize the only way they can be in the kingdom is if they're poor in spirit, but full in me. And then when they come into the kingdom, they, they recognize the, the joy and the beauty of my holiness. And in turn, it makes them mourn over the brokenness of sin. That because they've been adopted in this kingdom, they realize the world is missing out on Jesus and they mourn over the brokenness that sin brings. Jesus says, I'm not looking for people who want to come into this kingdom and then still live like sinners. So there's no place in the kingdom for those people. I'm looking for those who don't revel in their sin, but who mourn over the brokenness, the separation, the destruction that comes from sin. And when we gather on Sundays to sing together, it is a good thing for us to celebrate. But one of the things that we're not very good at doing is lamenting. We don't like to be sad. We, we don't like to, to look at those negative things. And yet it is in looking at the glory of Jesus that it helps us look at the destruction of sin in comparison. And so that, that as we join together and as we sing and as we study and as we shape one another, that it ought to make us so grateful more week after week after week for the grace and mercy of Jesus and then more and more compelled to go into a world that needs him. So I find it so interesting that Matthew begins, Matthew chapter five with that phrase, when he saw the crowds and then toward the end of Matthew chapter nine, he uses that phrase again, when he saw the crowds, so that Jesus had compassion on them. He used a word that meant it, it cut Jesus to the very depths of his soul. That people were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He said, I'm looking for people who want to come into this kingdom and who realize that it is all about me. And as a result, they, they're, they're not self-confident, but they're savior confident. And, and they mourn over the sin that separates people from the goodness of this kingdom. He goes on, verse five, blessed are the humble for they will inherit the earth. Yours, yours may say meek, blessed are the meek, blessed are the humble. It, it was a word that, that as Jesus used it, they knew is the picture of power under control. Power under control. If you've ever known someone who had to, to break a horse, this horse was wild, this horse was bucking, but they, they had the courage to get themselves on the back of that horse. It is a violent moment when you're on that horse and it is going all manner of direction, trying to get rid of the rider. But the rider knows that he has in mind the best things for this horse. So that rather than it living a wild life, it's, it's going to live this contained life for its benefit. That rather than having to find its own food, the, the owner will provide its food. Rather than find its own shelter, the, the owner will provide shelter. And in turn, that horse will go the direction the owner wants it to go. And over time, that horse is broken. 
And what's interesting is that horse is no weaker than when he started, but now all of his strength, rather than going in a variety of directions, trying to get rid of the rider, all of that horse's strength goes in one direction. And suddenly he's even more strong and more powerful than ever. Jesus says, blessed are those. Congratulations are due to those who rather than trying to throw off my rule and, and, and try to rebel against me, recognize they're nothing without me. And they mourn over sin and they humble themselves before me so that I can put all of their strength and abilities in this direction for my glory and for their good. Jesus says, congratulations are those are due to those who humbly submit themselves. He's not looking for the prideful. Jesus has no place in the kingdom for those who are prideful because only he deserves worship. Only he deserves glory. He goes on. He says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. He says, so, so now you, you come to him, not self-confident, but savior confident, mourning over sin and, and, and grateful that he has rescued you and, and has given you a life purpose and direction. He said, but I, congratulations are due to those who then come into the kingdom and who always want more, who recognize that Jesus is this, this unending fountain flowing with blessing, flowing with knowledge, flowing with transformation. He says, I'm not looking for those who, who just pray to prayer and say, well, Jesus, honestly, I just didn't want to go to hell. And I, I'm, I'm fine just being where we are. I've prayed and I was baptized and, and we're good. I'll just wait till the bus comes to take me to heaven and, and we'll be good. Jesus says, I'm not looking for those kind of people in my kingdom. So I'm looking for those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, who, who always want more of me, who, who want me to, to bring satisfaction. And then as you grow more closely to Jesus, you realize he's even bigger and greater than you ever saw. There's a great series out of the BBC called Doctor Who. Doctor Who is, is this amazingly intelligent being who has this machine through which he travels. It's called the TARDIS. It looks like a phone booth on the street corners of London. But when you walk through the door, you find that the inside is far larger than the outside. I wonder how many of us have come to Jesus simply thinking he's there to take away our sin and to give us eternal life. But the closer we get, the larger he becomes. The more deeply we, we come into connection with him, we realize he's, he's never ending. He said, I'm looking for those who are never satisfied. Verse seven, blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy. He says, I'm looking for people. Congratulations are due to those who pour out mercy, who realize I deserve to spend eternity in hell. But Jesus in his mercy rescued me, filled me with his spirit, is continually pouring his grace and mercy into me so that as I lament over sin, I find joy in Christ. As I submit to him, he continues to help satisfy my hunger and thirst and yet then grow even more in, in me. And, and we realize he has poured out so much mercy. How can I never show mercy to others? When, when people hurt me, I can forgive. When, when people misunderstand or, or, or misbehave, I can show mercy because I had offended the Holy One of all eternity. And he saw fit to forgive me. Who am I not to show mercy to others? Because if I can't forgive, I don't understand how much he's forgiven me. If I don't show mercy, I've forgotten how much mercy he's shown me. Jesus says, I'm looking for those who will show mercy, not those who are self-righteous, who think they've got it all figured out, who, who aren't willing to be humble and hungry. He says, I'm not looking for the vindictives. I'll be the avenger. I'll be the judge. I'm looking for those who will show mercy. Congratulations are due to those. He says, blessed are the pure in heart, verse eight, for they'll see God. What does that pure in heart looks like? look like? He says, I'm not looking for people who show up and say, I've got it all figured out. He said, I'm coming to Jesus because I'm, I'm like a child and I realize I'm nothing without him and there's always something to learn. There is a purity that says, I'm not grown up. I'm not sophisticated. I'm simply me. And Jesus has brought me home. Jesus says, I'm looking for those who are pure in heart because when you are that pure, you'll see me. That that as the disciples heard this, they, they knew that they were surrounded by people who, who worshiped all kinds of gods and deities and powers. He said, you want to see the one true God, the one who's made all things, who breathed everything into existence, who holds everything into place? 
If you'll come to me like this, congratulations are in order because you'll see him. In fact, you'll know me. He goes on. He said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. He calls them peacemakers, not peacekeepers. He said, you can go into a situation that, that's, that's fairly stable, and you can try to help keep the peace. But he said, that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for peacemakers, people who see chaos, people who mourn over sin, people who see the brokenness of life, and they are willing to take the kingdom to those places and make peace. Jesus is our peace. Then we go to, to marriages that are broken and help restore them. We go to those who are addicted and help free them. We go to those who are homeless and bring them home. Those, those who have been lied to and we tell them the truth. Those who have nothing, you give them everything. He said, you want to you be known as a son of God? Make peace. Bring the, the brokenness of the world into the wholeness of Jesus and watch Jesus change things. And people will look at you as a peacemaker and they'll go, you must be a Jesus follower. You must be one of his children. You must be a son of God because no one can do what you've done without the power of God at work in their lives. You want to live your best life now? Jesus says, congratulations, dude, to these kind of people. And then interestingly, in verse 10, he said, and blessed are those who are persecuted. Again, this is a terrible public relations campaign. Jesus is making sure that as the disciples have seen the crowds growing, he said, I want you to understand how this kingdom works, that I'm looking for those who are poor in spirit, not self-confident, those who mourn over sin, not revel in it, those who are meek and humbly submitted, not who are prideful. Those who are hungry and thirsty because the world can never satisfy. Those who will show mercy because they've been shown mercy. Those who are pure in heart because they're not so grown up and sophisticated that they can't humble themselves before me. Those who will make peace and who are willing to be persecuted because history has always shown. Those who are willing to stand for God are always attacked by the culture. Jesus says, what I'm telling you is this kingdom is a, a kingdom that goes against the culture for the benefit of the culture. Because he says, when you become these kind of people, congratulations are in order because you're becoming like Jesus. And in becoming like Jesus, you will then see the, the third thing is true. Jesus makes disciples influential in culture. Why would Jesus call for these characteristics? because he wants our lives not only to be aligned with him and to hunger and thirst for him and, and to put ourselves into his presence, but he says it's precisely because I want you to make a difference in the world around you. That's why we're asking these three questions of one another regularly. How's your walk? Because we want to know that we are continually coming to Jesus, presenting ourselves just as he's described here, poor in spirit, mourning over sin, humble before him, hungering and thirsting for his righteousness, showing mercy, being pure in heart, making peace, and enduring persecution. We say, how, how is your walk? Are you becoming more like Jesus? And then that second question is, where's your work? Because Jesus is addressing the disciples. There's a plurality here. You're not supposed to walk by yourself. You're to walk with others. And, and it is in enduring these things that you help others endure these things. You become an example. And others are examples for you that, that we, we're called to do this together because he wants us to have influence. Look what he says in verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt should lose its saltiness, if the salt should lose its taste, how can it be made salty again? In that day, salt was a commodity. It was valuable. In fact, the, the, the word for salt in Latin is S-A-L. They would pay soldiers with salt to where we get the word salary from salt because it was so valuable. He said, you know how valuable salt is. He said, if you'll live this way, you're going to be like salt. You're going to give flavor to life that nothing else can flavor. You're, you're going to preserve things so that they don't decay. You can put salt on a wound so that even though it's painful, it brings healing. He says, if you'll live like this, you're going to live your best life now because suddenly you're going to have impact that no one else can have because you are empowered by Jesus Christ. Then he says, you're also the light of the world. What does light do? Light gives direction. Light pushes out the darkness. If we were to take down all the lights and to light a tiny little candle, put it right here on the electric, you'd be able to see it. it. It would give light to the whole room and there's nothing that the darkness can do to stop the light. Jesus says, if, if you will let me change you, you'll live your best life now because suddenly you'll have influence 
helping stop decay, helping give flavor to life, helping purify and preserve. You'll help people see the direction they are supposed to go and, and push away the darkness that tries to confuse. He says, congratulations are in order for those who've discovered the way of the kingdom because then your life really has impact. And so Jesus is, is calling those disciples out and helping them to see, here's what the kingdom's about. One of the, the commentaries said it's as if Jesus was giving them an ordination sermon. There are times where a church will set aside someone to go into ministry or set aside deacons to help serve the church, and, and they'll sit before the church, and the church will lay hands over them, but typically somebody will stand before them and ordain, ordain them, help them to know God has ordained you, has set you aside, and they'll give them certain instructions, marching orders for what their new life is to look like. And, and Jesus is telling all of us, this is what life in the kingdom looks like. And so he's helping them to ask those questions. What is it that really makes me happy? And what is it that God wants to do to make me holy? And he was helping all of them to assess themselves. And so he's helping us to do the very same thing today. Asking, am I holy? Am I being set aside so that I can make a difference? That's why we asked that third question, who's your one? Because if, if I'm growing in Jesus and I'm helping the church grow in Jesus, then ultimately he wants us to be salt and light. And there's somebody near you who's far from God, who under the influence of Christ through you can come to him. What we saw in the, the, the first series that we went together in the, in the book of Numbers was a community has to be in a right relationship with God in order to have influence. And so Jesus is helping us as Trinity Baptist Church to ask, am I in a right relationship with him? Am I, am I thriving, moving toward those things that make me holy? Or am I waking up every day just asking Jesus to make me happy? Jesus wants us to be in a right relationship with him as the king. The worship team is going to come so that they can play and, and give you an opportunity to respond. Today, Jesus is telling you how to live your best life now. But some of you today would be willing to admit, i I've never started that relationship with Jesus. He's not king of my life yet. And there will be encouragers who will be down here today who would be happy to lead you into that thriving relationship with Jesus. But some of you would want to come down and visit with those encouragers and say, for too long, I, I, I've had my eyes on myself. And today, Jesus has helped me to see congratulations are due when I take my eyes off myself and put them on him. And these encouragers would be glad to, to pray with you and, and help you to confess this desire to walk more uprightly. Jesus started his ministry, we saw last week, with a call to repent. It is a change of direction that says, I'm going this direction, but the good news is this direction. And so for somebody today is the first time to repent and you're going to leave the domain of darkness and Jesus is going to transfer you into his kingdom. But what you realize when you're in the kingdom is every day is an opportunity to repent because every day your old nature will rise up and want to gloat and make yourself happy. But every day is that opportunity to say, Jesus, today I want to follow you once again. The encouragers will be here. It's time for us to respond. Let's pray together. Father, we, we do want to be a church that, that is aligned with you, that is holy and happy. A church that, that wants nothing more than for Jesus to be glorified and his kingdom to expand. And so I pray in the next few moments that, that you will help us to respond in a way that honors the king. We pray this in his name.